the epistle for the Requiem Mass is taken from Apocalypse chapter 14, verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From henceforth now saith the Spirit, that they may rest with their labors, for their works follow them. Today's Gospel is taken from St. John, chapter uh, 6, verses 51 to 55. At that time Jesus said to the multitudes of the Jews, I am the living bread which have come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that, he will, that I will give is my flesh and, and the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, except that you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life everlasting, and I shall raise him up on the last day. Thus far the words of Holy Scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, my dear friends, for coming here today to participate in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I had, I had thought I might preach on a number of things, especially this is the day of the celebration of the feast of Pope Pius X, St. Pope Pius X, probably one of the greatest popes that ever lived. He is the one that starved off the revolution in the church for a long time because he opposed modernism and liberalism and even issued encyclicals to that effect and he warned everybody of what was taking place in the church and what the enemy was planning to do. He told every one of the plots that were there even within the Vatican at his time to destroy Catholicism. And he warned against it, and he even gave us the beautiful prayer that we are to say before, con, uh, before ordination, where we swear our allegiance to the church, the oath against the errors of modernism. Much of that has been put aside, and so we see today we are living in an era where error has been passed down over and over again, especially since the Second Vatican Council. These errors... There are books out now showing eight massive heresies in the Second Vatican Council, and there are a number of others also contained there besides those big eight, those eight that are obvious heresies. They are heresies. Why? Because they oppose the dogmas and doctrines of Holy Mother Church. They, as a matter of fact, some of them, are so bold as to call Jesus Christ a liar. And in which do, do, do they do that? What we have just read here, Divine Providence, that this Mass was said today while I'm here, because I see the truth of it there, and I see it every time I read a, a Mass for the dead. Unless you eat and drink of my body and blood, I have no life in you, and you shall not be raised up on the last day. Does everybody hear that? He who is his to hear, let him hear. If you want to be saved, you have to be Roman Catholic. You have to belong to the church and you have to be baptized. That is the only way this can happen. And he says it in his own words here. If you, Unless you eat and drink of my body and blood, I have no life in you and you have no life in me. That's plain. Anybody who goes contrary to that is calling Jesus Christ a liar. Absolutely. It can't be any plainer. And the doctors of the church and the council of the church have constantly approved of this. So when the Second Vatican Council and the two priests that were so much associated with it, especially John Paul II and the present Benedict the Sixteenth, when they come out and say, my dear friends, that Jews do not have to be baptized. They do not have to be converted. That Christ did not die for their conversion, but he only chose certain ones to die for. That is not in keeping with, he says, I have come 
to redeem all mankind of their sin, and I've come to give my life for that. So those who say that the Jews or the Muslims or other groups are exempt from belonging to the church or being baptized, that is a lie. It's not only a lie, it's a blasphemy against God, and it's a scandal against Holy Mother Church. You must be baptized, you must belong to the church. To be saved, you must be under the Holy Father. And if I should, as I already have, uh, criticizing the, take the, the sayings of certain popes, I do not exclude them as being popes. We have had stupid popes in the past, and I'm sure we will probably have some in the future. We have had terrible popes in the past who have made horrible mistakes. But we don't follow their mistakes. Their mistakes were mo usually in morality, not in dogma. Some of the most immoral popes we have ever had would give their life to save the dogma and the doctrine of our church. And some today, they simply let it go and do nothing about it. And these things are terrible because they allow people to leave the church. It is no secret, my dear friends, that throughout the world 80% of the Catholics no longer practice the Catholic faith, and in some countries it is down to less than 5%. In the United States it is less than 20%. Why? Because the bishops and the popes and others did not come to the defense of Holy Mother Church when it needed them. In the past, in the Middle Ages, they would have taken up the sword and they'd have gone out and called a crusade to defend the truth. Now, we've got to get along with anybody, even if it means thrusting our souls into hell. No, my dear friends, we were not born and brought up Catholics. We have not made the sacrifice we have made in order, my dear friends, to be led nilly-willy into hell and to having our souls jeopardized martyrs of the past, they went gloriously into the arenas to be killed to defend things that were even less of what we are called to accept today. They gave their lives for it and we celebrate masses for them all the time. Why? Because they defended the church and gave their life for it. And now we, we are told, just forget all about that. That was then. This is now. If Jesus was here now, I was told by one, he would say something else, and I say, you are a liar, because you are calling Christ a liar, because he can only speak the truth. And the truth cannot change. It cannot change for me or you. It can't change a thousand years ago to a thousand years now. It is impossible for the truth to change. It remains <coughs> immutable, absolutely immutable. And don't accept anything less, less than that. And also, my dear friends, when they try to convince us that we just have to have a global religion, we just, one religion is as good as another. Indifferentism to religion, which is also a great part of the Second Vatican Council, that is a lie. Jesus said, one faith, one hope, one baptism. He didn't say when he told Peter, Thou art Peter, upon my churches I will build the faith. He said, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. In the singular, that is the Catholic church and none other. And none can equal it. None came from God. The only church that we have on this earth that came from God and for which Jesus Christ died for was the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is absolutely no salvation. Never. And there never will be. Because it cannot change. If the entire world wants to accept that, fine, I will never accept it. If anyone wants to save their, their faith, their soul, they will never accept it. No. And we have that from Christ himself. If it was that simple, don't you think that Christ would have compromised instead of going on the way to Calvary to be crowned with a crown of thorns to be to be beaten at the pillar or to walk with the heavy cross to Calvary and then give his life on the cross no he would not have done that he could have compromised but he could not because he was God and because he was truthful 
It would have been a lie. And today, with all these life, these martyrs that have been died, it's a wonder the girth doesn't open up <coughs> and say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because that's what the church has done. It has forsaken so many people. And we thrive for it through our traditional Catholic institutions like here to keep it alive so that there is a light seen, <coughs> seen from heaven down here on earth. That's what we st strive to do. And we must strive to do it to our last possible breath. Don't. And say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because that's what the church has done. It has forsaken so many people. And we thrive for it through our traditional Catholic institutions like here to keep it alive so that there, there is a light see, <clears throat> seen from heaven down here on earth. That's what we str strive to do. And we must strive to do it to our last possible breath. Don't ever give in to that. Don't accept these things that are given to you even by bishops and even by popes or even by cardinals that tell you that your church is just one among equals. That is a horrible blasphemy against God. My dear friends, things are becoming very hard on this earth. Our children are being led astray every day. The church today says very little about it. The bishops do not preach the salvation of the church from the pulpit. As a matter of fact, they, they welcome as speakers into their churches people who are anti-Catholic, people who are poor abortion. Every day the bishops and the priests give communion to those who vote for abortion and who practice it and who perform it, even though they're Catholics and they should be excommunicated. The only people who are subject to excommunication today from the church are traditional Catholics, you people. You are subject to excommunication by the church, but not its enemies, not its sinners. They, there is never a word said against this. And if you think that our lock is hard on the church today, just wait till the next election. I pray God that I can live until the next election so I can cast another ballot against Obama. That would be a goal in my life, to do that. I don't know how much better he will be replaced, but I can tell you if Donald Duck was running against him, I'd vote for Donald Duck. It would make more sense. And when that bishop came to me one day, uh, we were meeting with him, and he, and he told me, he said, Well, Father, don't you pray for the bishops? I said, Your Excellency, I pray for the enemies of the church every day. Every day I remember them at, Com at Compline. That's in our Compline. We have to do that. And I shall continue to do that. I shall continue to pray for all the enemies of the church, no matter what they wear on their head or what they claim to be. They must be prayed for, of course. We hate the sin, the sin but we love the sinner. But my dear friends, before all of this is over, you will see far more da drastic and things happen in Holy Church. You won't be able to even recognize it. The only, the only places you will find it are places like this where it's been kept. And even you may be reduced to going to church secretly. You may be reduced to having a priest come as they used to in the old days or the days of the terror in London and other places and behind the iron curtain to bring communion and give the sacraments to the faithful hidden and unknown to the, to the authorities. That may come. There have already been published things now about how they're going to destroy the, the church, especially in the United States, and published, it has been published in the paper that the first thing they have to do is remove all tax exemption from all Catholic hospitals, schools, churches, etc. That is the next thing that will happen if we don't get somebody who's human 
in the White House pretty soon. And it's all over the government. It's not just the White House. You know the, the saying, when you see the abomination of desolation sitting in the holy place, know you that the hour has come. And he's there. Don't forget it. And the devil is standing right there by the side waiting his commands. My dear people, I do not envy your situation in the world because I know from reading of history of which I've spent my entire life what is going to happen unless there is a, a miracle of God Sometimes I wish when I hear that they're having these floods all over the world or the droughts or the fires or the tsunamis that one huge wave would come over this world and wipe it clean and bring back the second coming that our Lord has spoken of. But we are not going to get away with it that easy. We are going to have to suffer. You will suffer, your children will suffer, and your grandchildren will suffer if they remain Catholic. And even if they don't, they will be introduced to the most perverse and horrible things that you can think of. And there will be no Christianity left anywhere except in hiding. That is a prediction I can make with full assurance because it is in keeping with the signs that are in the world today. So, my dear friends, what do we do? In a few minutes, the words of consecration will be uttered over a chalice of wine and a host. At that moment, Jesus Christ will come down into <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus Christ will come down into that host and that wine and he will be present at that altar. And at that moment, there will be a myriad of <coughs> a myriad of of angels hovering about that altar. And in a few minutes, you will come, and you'll receive the consecrated hosts in your own body, and you will walk back from the communion rail having Christ in you, Jesus Christ in you. Imagine that and think about it. You will be a temple of the living God at that time. And every time you do that, it will happen to you and it does happen to you. But we must be more convinced of that all the time so that our prayers and our praise to God collected together will rise up there to heaven and be heard because he hears all the everything we pray to him and that he will perhaps be moved to mitigate our sufferings to mitigate the terror that will come to perhaps have pity on some of us and take us before it all comes and to make us take us in a time not with an unprovided death but a time that we are in the state of grace so that we can go directly to heaven. Oh yes, being in a state of grace is necessary, you know, even though they tell us that you don't have to do that. Oh, yeah. It's when you're in the state of grace that you want God to take you. And I pray for him for that myself every day. Lord, keep me here as long as you like. But any time I'm in the state of grace, don't hesitate to take me up. Do it. It's a sure thing. Just recently, I made a general confession of my entire life, and I received the last rites. And... At that time, I remember praying afterwards and saying, Lord, I believe I'm still I'm in this state of grace. Grab me. Take me. Don't wait another second. That's all I want, to be saved. So, by our union of prayer, we will be saved, but we have to remain strong in the face of adversity and in the face 
of the things we face within our own society, but especially within our own church. There are not the people there anymore who want to fight. There are not the people anymore who want to put their lives on the line. They are not there. They're gone. They've, they've escaped. They want the good life. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's what they, that's what they want. If it feels good, do it. That's what they want. But my dear friends, that isn't how it was with Jesus Christ. That isn't how it will be to get you to heaven. We are, I am an altar Christo, another Christ. We are all in a way altar Christos. If Christ suffered for us, are we meant not to suffer for him? Especially me, a priest. I should. I should be doing that. And I will do it. I will do all I can to accomplish whatever I have to to get out of this world alive, that is, alive to eternal salvation, dead to sin, dead to the world, but alive to eternal salvation in heaven. And that's all that we're called upon in this life to do. Who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? God made me to know love and serve him in this world so that I can be happy with him in the next. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.